Welcome back, everyone. That was a quick, short break, but uh, we are excited to have you back. I certainly am, and I hope you're having a great time at Eyes on Dry Eye. We are crushing it on the numbers, lots of education, so many great sessions going on. But I am most excited for our next guest, <laughs> Dr. Laura Perryman. She is fantastic, good friend of mine. Let's go ahead and bring her on. Hey, hey, how's it I'm going? Yeah, great. How are you? I'm doing well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Awesome to be here. Congratulations to the whole team. What a great start to yeah. this meeting that's just so comprehensive and focused on my favorite topic. I right. know. Always, <laughs> always has been, always will be. Yeah, that's actually yeah. funny. I mean, it, it really, I mean, I've I heard it like listening to a couple of sessions before folks just calling you out and thank you for being involved with so many sessions. And uh, I know everyone is learning so much from you at this, at this meeting. So thanks. And it's crazy. We're only halfway done with day one. We have so much to go. So and I'm sure you'll be busy at this at the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated with just uh, your approach to dry disease diagnosis, treatment, prognosis. I mean, walk us through, you know, your general approach there and um, the way you do it. The way I do it. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the, the secret sauce to the madness, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> yep. Yes. So <clears throat> I'll be real honest. I my approach has morphed over time. Mm -hmm. the, and that's one of the things I love so much about dry eye is the constant learning, like the rate of innovation, the rate of advancements, the rate of what we understand and the treatment strategies we have and how we dovetail it together and um, the published literature and the communities like this one, sure. where people come together to exchange best practices, best ideas, um, clinical pearls, innovations, all these things. So it's it's a work in progress. So what I can tell you is I started off with a slit lamp and a bioglo strip. And that's all I had back in the day. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and, that's, that's and honestly, that's, that's basics. That's all you actually really need to get started in treating dry eye disease. It's just looking, listening. Yep. Yes. And, and having some compassion around it because it makes patients miserable. I like that you bring um, that in. The bedside manner. You've always been great at that. Yeah. Yeah, I suffer from dry eye myself, so I get it. And it's yeah. um, I find great satisfaction in taking that really frustrated patient and helping them get their life back, oh. helping them get their groove back. You know, it's an amazing feeling. I'm sure you've done it for many. There's no doubt about that on a daily basis. You know, um, everyone ask questions in the chat mm -hmm. if you'd like. We are monitoring them here. So any questions for Dr. Perryman, send them through. Yeah. So I've got another one for you. So do you uh, differentiate based on severity? So, you know, patient coming in, kicking and screaming versus, ah, it bothers <laughs> me a little bit, not too bad. Of course you do, but tell me more. Right. So, um, you know, I think it uh, dovetails back to the intake and mm -hmm. how we approach the dry patient. Uh, we, we cast a very broad net because what I've found over time, especially with my MD training, is that dry eye really involves the whole person on um, top to bottom, front to back. It's, it's, um, there's so many different disease states that are involved in it. It is truly a multifactorial disease. And I think it's a big tent disease. And so a lot of, a lot of smaller circus animals can be creating mischief in the big tent as well. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a matter of casting that broad net, creating that safety net for that patient, and then really identifying what all is going on under there. So it's, um, it's a, it's a broad-based approach. It's a, it's a uh, stepwise approach. I do follow the expert guidelines. Um, and when you do that, and when you do the testing, I, I do believe in doing the testing. I follow the, the four steps, ask the questions, do your diagnostics, assess your risk factors, and categorize and treat. I do mm -hmm. do those four steps. Mm -hmm. um, the mild, moderate, and severe patient can be delineated with history, and your exam findings, which is uh, staining and your exam findings. So just like the TFOS is two uh, strategy for level one through four of categorizing patients, mirrors very closely the International Task Force guidelines, mirrors very closely the Cedars Aspen's algorithms. So all of these things are pretty similar in um, roughly categorizing patients in a scale of severity. And when you, once you have established that, that can help guide your strategic approach and you can stick straight to the consensus guidelines or as you get comfortable with that you can you can start uh, paying attention to some of the little variances in the patterns that you see and learning to ask different questions and uncovering 
um, other other comorbidities as well. Yeah, absolutely. I've got to open our dry eye report here, which everyone can download in the conference bag. Be sure to check that out because I want to bring it into this next question here around discussion of ocular lubricants and how that kind of flows in your uh, protocol for yourself. But we asked uh, over 757 optometrists here, what is your preferred go-to-line uh, frontline treatment for inflammatory dry? 7.7% said artificial tears. There's so many other interesting answers here, but ocular, ocular lubricants, of course, is like a mainstay and you know will, will vary based on the type of dry and whatnot, but walk me through that. That's a whole whole game in and of itself. Sure. So I think, um, you know, protecting the ocular surface while you're working on restoring homeostasis is very important for the occasional symptomatic relief. It's very important. Moisturizing the ocular surface, protecting that ocular surface is very important. Just like when we wash our hands too often, mm -hmm. especially in the COVID, right? So you have, to, <laughs> yeah. you have to moisturize and protect your hands afterwards. So I think lubricants are a, a, a an important basic aspect mm -hmm. of managing dry eye disease. I love preservative-free options. I love the preservative-free vials. There's um, formulations are different and they're, they've become uh, quite smart and based on hardcore science on protecting cells from desiccating stress from apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Mm -hmm. All of these things go into the formulations, which are um, helpful to the patients. And so when it comes to selecting um, a preservative-free artificial tear, you've got a wide variety of choices and uh, you've got some old friends uh, in fresh coat. It's a wonderful old friend. You've got new friends. It's, uh, I think the important part is for the clinician to make the suggestion rather than leaving the poor patient to go to that section in the drugstore. Yeah. It's uh, so overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's important. And I know what I'm looking for, right? And I get overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh. Right there with so you. I think it's uh I think it's important for the clinician to make the recommendations and it's it's uh, fun to be able to carry and dispense uh, some of these formulations that we have in clinic. Yeah, absolutely. And to just follow up on that, I was looking through the report again. The the first line treatment or, or what docs pick up for aqueous deficient dry eye was 48%, which makes sense as the as the first option. Reading the meibomian gland one there, 7%. You know, just to put that into perspective. Um, thinking further around lubricants here, you know, how often do you recommend your dry disease patients ocular lubricants as initial monotherapy without any additional therapeutic options? Well, by the time you get to see me, <laughs> you've already tried that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So not very often, not but very as often. far as um, just just in out in the wild, um, everyday clinical practice, the the mild patients, it's important to catch them in the early stages because you actually have a golden opportunity to help prevent the evolution into adaptive immunity and the chronic double vicious circle of ongoing inflammation. So catching it moisturizing it, protecting from those ocu continuing ocular surface stressors, desiccating stress, you actually have the potential to prevent that conversion from innate mm. to adaptive immunity. And now you've got, now you got to go chasing after it with immunomodulators and yep. steroids and everything else. So. Yep. And, and how do you know when it's time to put a patient on a therapeutic and you know, how do you determine selection? Right. So we, we do the advanced uh, testing in clinic. And so I look at osmolarity. I do think it's an important metric of the functioning of the lacrimal functional unit. I look at M MMP9. I'm, I want to know the inflammatory burden of the ocular surface. If you have, let's say, a level two dry patient, but their MMP9 is strongly positive, I'm talking about immunomodulators and steroids. Right. Um, and I, I want to quiet the dendritic cells and that immunopathophysiology that's going on that's generating that super high MMP9 number. And so, you know, prescription therapies um, become very important in, um, in, in, in addressing, helping somebody that's gotten to that stage, getting yeah. it under control. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. And, and I'm curious, you know, how, how do you introduce um, specifically maybe the scripts or the dialogue you're having to introduce a corticosteroid like Flarex, what is that sounding like when you're going down that route? Right. So when it comes to uh, steroids for, let, let's say I've got a level two dry patient, mm -hmm. their osmolarity is fairly abnormal, but their MMP9 is fairly strong. 
I'm going to be doing an immunomodulatory therapy and a steroid therapy such as Flarex. So what I like about Flarex is you've got the strength of a Pred Forte and the gentleness of an FML. Yep. And what's special about it is the uh, fluoromethylone acetate, that little tiny O double bond C, the methyl group on the end, that tiny little group at the end is where the secret is. Right. That is that's called an ester and it gets cleaved by your epithelial cell esterases. And the benefit of that is that how that steroid can get in to the corneal tissues where those activated dendritic cells are and can calm that chronic vicious circle immunopathophysiology in, um, in, a, in a more direct way because you're able to deliver that calming medication right where you need it. Yeah. So those, those, and then when you go to prescribe it, make sure you put FML acetate because then the pharmacy can't swap it out for a generic FML alcohol, which doesn't have that ability to get into those deeper tissues and calm that immunopathophysiology much more strategically and precisely because uh, you're actually getting deeper into the tissues. Yeah, not all steroids are created equal, that is for sure. They're not. No. And there's there's all these, all these misconceptions about, well, this is a stronger steroid and that's a softer steroid. It's like, well, it's actually much more nuanced than that because yeah. if you look at the concentrations of the steroids, uh, something like FML acetate is 0.1% and um, uh, prednisolone is 1%. And yet when you look at the inflammation reduction scores in animal models, uh, a whole bunch of different steroids against each other, an FML acetate, such as Flarex, has the same inflammation reduction value as prednisolone yeah. at 10x higher concentration. Mm. So you're able to get that same calming effect with less drug, which has the potential to be less irritating to the other ocular tissues because ocular tissues are irritated by drug concentration and preservative burden. So if you can nuance it both and make that activated immunopathophysiology just move right on by, these are not the droids you're looking for. Yep. You know, and that whole thing calm down, yep. you have uh, a good benefit. And I love that the fact that pH is 7.5, it's very, very comfortable when it goes into the eye because of that, uh, of that pH. Yeah. Now, how do you ensure that your patients can get Flarex? I mean, there's no generic equivalent here, so um, that could be tricky to navigate. Uh, you know, you're busy, you got patients out the door, I'm sure you do, but uh, how do you navigate that? Right, so in your EMR, make sure you have it queued up for fluoromethylone acetate, 0.1%, and then the pharmacy by law can't swap it out mm -hmm. for an alcohol. Um, so that's a hot tip. Um, make sure that uh, you have um, uh, your patient QR code scan or have a coupon for My Eye Savings. I'm a big fan of the MyEyeSavings.com, and it also helps to eliminate some of the prior authorization phone calls yeah. that we get far too much of. And I want to have a sidebar discussion about that someday, about how did we, how did we become these frogs at a slow boil? Like, at what point can we fight back against these bullies? I'm yeah. just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will follow you into battle. Um, and what about? Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. What about dosing? And um, I know that sometimes can be confusing for docs. So, any quick tips there? Dosing, yes. So, uh, let's say I've got um, you know rip roaring inflammation situation. Then I'm going to be dosing it more frequently. Mm -hmm. You know, QID for the first week, TID for the next, BID for the next, and a slow taper like so. If it's just a periodic flare up. Um, then it might look like twice a day for a couple of days. It just depends on the clinical situation and the degree of um, inflammatory cow that has escaped to the barn that I have to go lasso back in. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, and what about duration? Uh, is this something long term, short term, mm -hmm. in the middle? I guess it's like the. Uh, right. What is I've that? used it in all those situations yeah. short term, medium term, um, longer term, I shy away from uh -huh. in general a steroid. Um, the exceptions with that would be intraocular inflammation, such as uveitis. That's just a different animal altogether. We're talking about surface disease. Um, yeah, so the long term, I think you have to be caught. We all have to be cautious with long term steroids. I mean, we've all seen patients who were on, you know, generic steroids for years and come in with 0.9 cups and cataracts. Like <laughs> yeah. we need, we need to be. Oh, that's a bummer yeah. when that happens. And it's unfortunately a little too common. So as a long term, we just have to be careful and mindful. But also at the same time, don't be afraid of steroids. They're wonderful 
little forgive the punch shot in the arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sherry Speak here has a quick question, and let's do this one pretty quick here. But uh, many of my dry disease patients suffer from recurrent corneal erosion. Can you share your preferred treatment for RCE? <sighs> recurrent corneal erosion. <laughs> so my first thought is, where is the inflammation coming from? Right. Right? <laughs> and it's uh, oftentimes advanced ocular surface disease. If you look at the MMP9 in those patients, you'll find that it's elevated. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of MMP9 is that the epithelial cells uh, can't, um, their anchoring fibrils don't have as much to attach to. The, the uh, basement membrane is compromised also because of high MMP9. So it turns out recurrent corneal erosion syndrome is a high MMP9 disease state. And so guess what I'm doing? I'm whipping out my anti-MMP9 strategies yep. to get that under control. Um, and so that looks like my immunomodulators, my steroids. Um, I actually, IPL can help mm. drive down inflammation as well and help all those other medications work better on extreme circumstances where the cornea just like melts away um, and you've got now a defect, a large one. Right. Go ahead, or here's what I do. I'll, then I'll go on and do a superficial keratectomy and then place an amniotic membrane um, over the surface to help promote healing. And um, it, it functions like restoring the basement membrane and now the epithelial cells, when they heal, they come across, they have they have good soil to hang on to in the garden. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, no, thanks for that. Thanks, Sherry, for the question. Um, it, it seems like flares are becoming just more and more part of the conversation mm -hmm. here. I guess what are yes. just, do you notice a certain characteristic patient type or just something around the, the maybe demographic or, or are you seeing this more right. often in certain patients? Right, so it's that's so interesting that you asked that question. So. I've been doing this for a long time and there are predictable cyclical flares in the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. and they are right around Valentine's Day. <laughs> Interesting. Right around mid to late March. There's something that blooms around here yep. and it's like I'm talking within a few days. Wow. Then all of a sudden there's flare ups um, and, and it hits again during the forest fire season because and we were able to show MMP9 correlates with um, poor air quality index. And so that would be another reason to use a uh, course of steroids. And then again, in the fall, when the weather changes and the rains come, there's uh, some kind of mold or something that happens where there's these predictable uh, uh, flare ups. And so that would be an appropriate time to layer on a temporary steroid on top of your long term inflammation control mm. strategy. And there's been an immunologic bridge described between allergic conjunctivitis and meibomian gland dysfunction. And you have two things in your toolkit mm -hmm. to break that immunologic bridge between allergic conjunctivitis and meibomian gland dysfunction. They are lofitograss and steroids. Yep. So in order to decrease that driver, you've got to control the allergic conjunctivitis. Thank goodness we've got you know this wonderful uh, prescription grade uh, product, Zerviate. It's the newest kit on the block. We've got all these different strategies for addressing the allergic driver in, mm -hmm. and then we have tools for blocking the immunologic bridge towards MGD. So we have to think in these broader terms about interrelated mechanisms of dry eye. Oh, I love speaking with you. You feel like you have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah. That's the beauty of it. We're all learning together. There's that's so many. It so fun. Yeah, there's so many tools in the toolkit, and that's why I'm so happy to be doing this event because there's no doubt about it. Toolkits are replenished after this one. Um, I've got one more question here. I've, there's a multiple that I wanted to ask you, but this one in particular. Are there any tips or tools or best practices you would recommend when speaking to a peer about the need to establish or update their dry disease protocol? I think protocol is so important here, and you obviously have a great uh -huh. one. So what was the first part of that question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just basically... Tips or tools, if you're talking with a colleague, what tips or tools mm. can they use to update their dry disease protocol and just start getting in a better rhythm? Yes. Um, my, my best advice is to start simple, mm -hmm. right? And as you get comfortable, layer things on. When you're building a Dagwood sandwich, you start off with two pieces of bread. <laughs> yeah. And then you add on some mustard and some, you know, durkey sauce and may or whatever it is aioli mm -hmm. that sounds good. sounds good and then you layer in all the goodies and now you've got an awesome tagwood sandwich but you got to start with two slices of bread and then as you get comfy you just keep layering stuff on yeah 
No, it's a, it seems like a very logical way to go about it. But yeah, don't be afraid. <laughs> Start with the basics and expand from there. Um, any other questions? Yeah, and don't thoughts? be afraid of our devices, our in-office devices. Don't be afraid of them. Oh, yeah. They're um, wonderfully effective and powerful and help all of our wonderful medications work even better because it's just another it's another crack at the bat. And, I'm, and you and I will be talking about that uh, tomorrow Yep. Uh, regarding IPL. Yep, yep, no, totally. Yeah, it's one big happy dry eye family. Everything seems to be resting <laughs> on, on the other thing. It needs, you know, all of these opportunities to help our patients out. Um, so go, yep. do go check out the exhibit hall booths, everyone. See what's there, check into the booth, chat with the sales reps, um, and for sure, go to that conference bag, donate a dollar. We'll donate a dollar on your behalf to Optometry Giving Sight. Great charity. We've got it going. The money's getting up there. Uh, the dryer report is there. But Dr. Perryman, always a pleasure. So many great sessions with you coming up. I will speak with you later, and thanks for coming on. Thank you. Okay, talk to you later. Bye.